and good morning to each one of you. I'm so glad that you could join us today for our Easter service here at First Unitarian Church. If you are a visitor to our live service today, you are especially welcome. And we're so glad that you found your way here this morning. I hope that you'll stay for our coffee hour after the service right here on this same link. And afterwards, I invite you to visit our website, slcuu.org, or our social media channels to learn more about our congregation and how you can be a part of what we're doing here at First Unitarian. Just one announcement as we get underway this morning, we are wrapping up our annual pledge campaign. So if you haven't turned in your pledge card yet, now is the time to do so. We're still missing a few. So, uh, and our hope had been to have them all in this week. So please make time to send yours in today if you haven't already done so, or you can use our website donation portal or the Givelify app to make your pledge. I want to give a big thank you to all the wonderful folks who have taken up the challenge to increase their pledges, and many have increased 20% or more. Thank you so much for responding in such a generous way. We're all building the future of our church together, and it's not too late for you to be a part of it. Now I invite you to take a breath and enter into the spirit of worship as Reverend Tom offers his own greeting and our chalice lighting. Thank you, Monica. I'd also like to bid all of you a good morning and, of course, a very happy Easter. Usually, Easter in a Unitarian church resembles a convention of skeptics. You ever notice that? Everyone sitting with their arms folded, daring the minister to utter the word, resurrection. Will he say it this year? And since they're all armed with scientific minds and firm in the belief that natural law can never be altered, I have often felt through my 46 years of ministry that perhaps it's best we just erased Easter from our liturgical calendar. But then I'm always surprised always surprised that deep down we're somehow ready for a message that that need not pass the litmus test for pure science mesmerized perhaps by bulbs just beginning to crack the soil the heart opens to the prospect of new possibilities and we soon succumb to resuming the dance of life called spring Symbol of light and truth, symbol of warmth and freedom. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love.
Good morning. The story of Easter is complicated for Unitarian Universalists. Recognizing our faith's Christian roots, we can still find meaning in the story of Jesus's life and death, hope, renewal, friendship, memory. Years ago, a minister and religious educator, Sophia Lyon Foz, wrote today's story. Like most beloved ministers, she was a storyteller first, literally writing some of our first Unitarian Universalist storybooks. Today's story is called The Story of Easter. Jesus was a great teacher long, long ago who preached God's love for everyone, as did our Universalist forebearers like John Murray, Olympia Brown, and Joseph Fletcher Jordan. Jesus taught that we should care for the poor and forgive people who hurt us. In his lifetime, Jesus influenced many people to love one another as they loved their God. Twelve of those people were called the disciples of Jesus. They traveled with Jesus and listened to him preach day after day. In Jesus's time, the Roman leaders and the Jewish leaders did not like him. They were afraid he would lead a rebellion and upset the way things were. As Jesus became more and more popular, the leaders planned to have him killed. One of Jesus's disciples named Judas betrayed Jesus and helped the leaders with their plan. The night before Jesus died, he was celebrating the Jewish holiday of Passover. He celebrated at a Seder with his friends, the 12 disciples. The next day, he was arrested and then later killed. What happened after Jesus died began the religion we know as Christianity. Many Christians believe that after Jesus was killed, he rose from the dead and went to heaven. Many Unitarian Universalists see this story differently. The people who followed Jesus were brokenhearted after he died. They struggled to understand why God had allowed their teacher to be killed. Surely, someone so connected to God, so overflowing with goodness, did not deserve the punishment of a criminal or a rebel. As these men and women gathered day after day in each other's homes, they began to recall the wonderful experiences they had had with Jesus. They told one another of times when Jesus was wise, when Jesus was kind. The very tone of Jesus's voice and the look on his face would come back to them so vividly that it seemed, sometimes, as though he was right there with them once again. Some of the people had dreams in which Jesus seemed so real that the dreamers could not tell whether they were asleep or awake when they saw him. Some declared positively that they had seen Jesus again. He had talked with them. The rumor spread that Jesus had come out of his coffin and that two disciples had seen him and that several of the women had talked with him and they would see him only for a few moments and then he would mysteriously disappear again. Finally, several of them dreamed that they saw Jesus rise up from the earth higher and higher until he disappeared entirely. They believed he had gone to, he to, be, to heaven to be with God. And after that, their dreams of seeing him and talking with him stopped. People who had these experiences believed that Jesus was different from other people. Some believed that Jesus was so holy and great that he would come back to the earth and save the world. That is one reason why Christians call Jesus the Savior. The years passed by. The people who knew Jesus died. Their children and their children's children and their children's children also died, but Jesus did not come back. It's been over 2,000 years, and he has still not come back. There are those who still hope that he will come back to life again. Others, including Unitarian Universalists, believe that Jesus will never once again live on this earth. His body is not coming back, but his spirit, his spirit never needs to die. His spirit is in his words and deeds, which still give us wisdom today. For example, when he was alive, Jesus taught the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, where he said that people who were poor, hurt, and struggled are loved by God, and therefore, we must love them too. When someone's physical body dies, 
the people around them who loved them and valued them will keep their memory alive, just like the followers of Jesus have remembered his teachings and his spirit long after his death. The life and death of Jesus reminds us that our spirits live on in the people we love, the people we teach, and the people we are in community with. May it be so. This time last year, the word being proclaimed from the high hill of our country was that we would all be reopened by Easter. The pandemic would turn out to have been a bad dream. Life would return to normal. We would all be singing hallelujah. Instead, a year later, we are still singing Hosanna, which means save us, and singing it under our breath, behind our masks, the palm parade canceled again. Perhaps we had hoped that this Easter really would feel like rolling the stone from the tomb. But although I believe that metaphor never goes out of style, I have a different myth in mind this year. I'm turning instead to another great story being told around the world this week. It's a story of families painting their doors and praying that the angel of death will pass over. It is, of course, the story of people avoiding a plague. But even as they finally make their escape, dramatic as it is, they do not escape across the sea into the promised land. Rather, they are turned out into 40 years of wilderness. The people follow a pillar of light and smoke into God knows where, and it seems exciting for a while, but soon the people get bored and frustrated. They want to be in the promised land now. This is not just about vaccine rollouts and lifting restrictions. Of course it is, but it's about more than that. It's also about the world that is waiting to be born after this great trial. Maybe the promised land doesn't actually exist until we've done some wandering, until we've drawn a map of the land we've escaped, a world of pollution and income inequality and police brutality and failing systems of care, and then conjured a clear vision of where we want to go. It couldn't be done while we were all just trying to stay alive. We need this wilderness time of wandering, wondering, and waiting to cast the spells to actually create the place we are trying to go. And when we get there, we'll wait for those who are bringing up the rear. And then we'll all go in together. Now let us draw in a breath together. And be thankful for the manna we've gathered in this time. New ways of working. Time together with our kids before they're grown. A new appreciation for the neighborhoods we live in and the people who make everything work. Gratitude for the small, everyday, personal interactions that make society social. An appreciation for the manifold gifts of solitude and fervent desire to gather. Now, with that breath of gratitude, imagine just one new thing that you want to bring into the promised land with you. One gift or one new thing that you want to build there. Something you're willing to commit to working for, even fighting for. Name it. See it. Feel it in your fingertips. You can type it into the chat while you listen to the music if you're so moved. Then think of one person you can share this vision with, because none of us can do this alone. 
We will not wander forever. We will get over hand in hand together. Amen.
It sure does the heart good to, uh, to hear the choir. Certainly time to resurrect that wonderful choir again, hopefully real soon. And that music with the uh, beautiful images put together by Tristan Moore just uh, really captured the, uh, the essence of uh, the spirit of life. Beautiful. Sight and sound. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. You know, we have not yet <clears throat> fully emerged from the psychic, social, and physical scars of the brutal pandemic year, not to mention the toll of an interminable lockdown. <clears throat> but it feels like we're on the up escalator, the pivot out of despair. It's as if we can read the calling card of hope that will soon stabilize us once again with the comforts of normal. Normal, as we've come to recognize, is sort of a moving target. Politicians endeavor to always move us from the dregs of life to achieve a blessed new normal. Long ago, it was promised that it would be normal to have a chicken in every pot. And now it's the promise of a shot in every arm. Normalcy seems the antidote to enduring tough times. Don't worry, don't worry, we, we will get to normal once again. But normal extends to many facets of our lives. For example, we miss church more than ever before. We want to return to our normal church-going habits. We miss the theater, in restaurant dining, pubs, sporting events. We want out of solitude, which has darkened our lives, and step into the sunshine of community once again. We hear people saying odd things like, I want to get back to normal by the summer. What on earth does that mean? I mean we, we never talked like that before. But then again, we may never have been quite this depressed or alone or afraid before either. It, you know, it just wasn't normal. But normal can also be a contentious concept. Now, I, I love this recent headline from the New York Times. The U.S. is edging towards normal, alarming some officials. Can't you hear them say, oh, no, no, not normal. It's, it's too soon to be normal. Dr. Fauci says he's not sure when we'll return to normal. And yet Dr. Marty Macri, a professor of surgery and health policy at Johns Hopkins predicts COVID will be mostly gone by April, allowing Americans to resume normal life. Well, that's almost too much to consider. You know, most of us would be content with returning to just a little bit of normal. Now, just a just a sampling of normalcy will will do well just about now. I mean, you know, it was just a year ago. We had no compass to help us out of our dire situation. We were lost with no idea of where to go next. But now a new normal dances before us with hope and expectations. <clears throat> so I was wondering, you know, this being Easter. How did Christianity, some 2,000 years ago, address what had to be understood then as the new normal? I can envision the headlines back then. Rome edges towards a new normal, alarming some officials. And St. Paul, in his epistles, sending out 13 all told to communities in Rome, Corinth, Galatia, and to Hebrews and Christians, and to individuals like Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. All these letters were really about a new normal taking hold. They said, when you die, you don't really die. 
you just kind of get relocated. Well, that's that's the new normal. Now, if you've sinned, even sin big, don't worry about it. You're forgiven. That's the new normal. Love the poor, love the stranger, love your enemy. It's the new normal. Wow. Spring is also the new normal, isn't it? It arrives after we've been buried in cold and ice and snow for a long time. The color green was conspicuously absent, and the outdoors resembled a stark, still life. E. E. Cummings wrote the great line in one of his poems, which goes, The snow doesn't give a soft, white dam whom it touches. Isn't a great line? The snow doesn't give a soft, white dam whom it touches. We know this feeling of indifference well. COVID spread its death indiscriminately. It made no sense. The wintry chill of death found people in their prime, people who devoted their lives to the good, people who loved and were loved, leaving in its wake the shroud of grief for family, lovers, and friends. Now, how do they, how, how do any of us in our despair make our way to a, a springtime that can melt the winter lodged in the soul? You know, ultimately, it is hope that serves us like a compass, guiding us towards a resumption of life, albeit to a new normal. All of our lives, are dotted with winters giving way to spring. You know, we call it renewal or healing or restoration or new opportunities. But in the religion biz, which I feel is akin to a kind of poetry of the spirit, this is all called resurrection. I cannot, I cannot imagine my life without a series of resurrections, and each one a miracle. And miracles we come to understand in our advancing maturity, miracles live in the realm of poetry. And that's why we resonate, I think, with the poet E.E. E. Cummings who wrote, we can never be born enough. Birth, death, rebirth, again and again and again. That's what blesses our lives. The constant miracle of resurrections forever giving us new life. What a heartening message. The winters of our despair do not carry the seeds of finality. There are resurrections, plural resurrections that keep reviving the still life wintry terrain with, with spring's vast array of color. Or as Emerson wrote so fittingly in his depiction of spring, the earth laughs in flowers. Now we have all been knocked down by injuries and illness. We have suffered grief in losing a loved one, losing love, losing a job, we love, losing hope of ever being reborn again. We all know what Billy Collins meant when he said, life is no endless string of picnics in July. We all know there is also winter. Even, even if you live in South Florida, there is also winter. Our spirits are frozen for no other reason than because we are human. Life is a series of deaths, referred to as Good Fridays in the poetry of Christianity. But the poem does not end on the cross. 
the poem concludes with the defeat of death, healing, resurrection. We can never be born enough, implying that our lives know many deaths, but praise be for the renewal of life again and again and again on this earth and in our souls. We couldn't make it through life if it were otherwise. But when we are reborn, the terrain on which we walk anew is, well, it's changed a bit. Given the grief we've experienced, the death, the loss, the sorrow, we're perhaps then a little wiser, a bit kinder, a little gentler in this makes the, and this makes the, the resumption of life just a little bit different. It's like we're navigating, what? A new normal. You know, life, life is the same, but not quite the same. How can it be? We've learned so much and keep learning anew. So about 2,000 years ago, this poem called Easter speaks to us of transformation. Every culture throughout history has gravitated towards the expression of new life emerging after a metaphorical death. And if you go back another 500 years before Christianity, you come across a Greek scholar named Herodotus, who is known as the father of history. Now, he wrote the first history book called the histories, in which he writes about the origins of the Greco-Persian War. But what he's really famous for, in my way of thinking, is that he recognized that the essence of human nature was needing renewal. We need to begin again. We need to have this idea of resurrection. He observed, and this these are basically his words, that when human beings going through, go through adversity, they need the hope of re-emerging. So he looks for a metaphor in which to express his poem, a poem about the miracle of new life. And he gives us the phoenix, the phoenix rising from his ashes. Herodotus, well, you gotta love his honesty. He wrote, although I actually never saw a phoenix. You, you can't be more brutally honest than that. I'm gonna give you a metaphor. I never saw it. This is really metaphorical. He said, I never saw a phoenix, but I did see a painting of one. And he saw a phoenix with a tail of gold and scarlet. And the life expectancy is between 500 and 1,000 years. And near the, the end of life, the phoenix builds a, a nest of twigs that then ignite. The nest and the bird burn fiercely and are reduced to ashes from which the young egg arises, reborn anew to life again. To live again, isn't that a miracle? Isn't that the essence of human hope? Isn't that how all religious poems intend to serve us? Giving us the metaphors, giving us the images, and ultimately giving us the hope that we can reemerge after adversity finds us. And you know, it always will find us. We can never be born enough. Amen.
Thank you, David. I'm not uh, I'm not in church, so I don't have one of those fancy uh, extinguishers for the flame. So um, instead of high church, we're going to have to go low church, if you forgive me. Ah, it works the old fashioned way. It really does. Easter is so liberating. It relaxes the rational mind and opens us to the grace of miracles. Think of the miracles your life has already experienced. The healing, the love, the hope, the forgiveness, all wrapped in the poetry of metaphor. How impoverished our lives would be otherwise. The fact that we exist at all is a miracle. And add to that the blessings of love and kindness and generosity and hope that moves us to a certain level of profundity. Easter, it is time to join the chorus and sing our praises to life. Amen.